Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. It's all of grace. So you can combine the two. So when we say we're trusting Christ, that's the grace part. But if we say we have to be water baptized also to be saved, that's the work part. If we say it's by grace, trusting Christ, but we also have to keep the Ten Commandments, that is also by works to get into heaven. Now, is that to say we should never be baptized? Yes, we're baptized by immersion after we trusted Christ as an outward sign of something we've done in the past. So we don't front load the gospel with works. Watch this. We don't back load the gospel by having to do good works once we're saved to stay saved. Everything about salvation is by grace and not of works. And that's the economy that God is working on with the Jewish people. So to become, in their case, what we might say, uh, a saved Jew, it's based on their grace, not keeping any of their Old Testament law. That's something that they do outwardly, but not as a way to get into heaven. They needed to believe in their Messiah. So what happened then to Israel? Here you got the remnant. God chose with them with grace. What happened to the whole country or the whole nation of Israel? What, what went on? Well, there was a great deal of discipline that went on. They were disciplined, but they weren't completely rejected. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture. If you want to read with me, you can. It's going to be found in Jeremiah 31. It's not a long passage. But I wanted you to see from the Old Testament writing, not just the New Testament, what I'm teaching you here is coming from both Testaments, as Paul now speaks to this. It's a very eye-opening passage. And I'll just read a portion of it, not the entire passage. Jeremiah 31, in the beginning of verse 31, it says... Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord Jehovah, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 34. It says, They will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me in the future, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. Here it is. Underline it. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin will I remember no more. So God says, I will discipline them, but I'll never cast them away forever. Verse 37 says, Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured, and we're still trying to measure them now with the new uh, uh, satellites and spaceships going up to Mars and Pluto, and the foundations of the earth are searched out below, we have a submersible submarine that can go already 35,000 feet below the surface of the earth, but we still can't search out all the foundation. He says if we could do all of that, he says, then I will also cast off the offspring of Israel for all that have done. And he says, I'm not going to cast them away forever. Go to Psalm, if you will, for a moment. Psalm 89. What a great passage of comfort. And this is kind of a passage of what parents might do with their own children. So look in Psalm 89. Just listen to this neat passage. He says, If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they violate my statutes, the Lord says, and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Let me just pause for a moment. The Jewish people are underneath a lot of the judgment of the Lord and they're experiencing a lot of that now because they have walked away from what God told them to do. And it's not merely keeping all the Old Testament sacrifices. It all begins with not accepting Jehovah Yasha, their Messiah, as their own Savior. And then from that comes all their activities. Verse 33, and he says, But I will not break off my loving kindness from him. Basically saying, no matter what they've done, I will not stop loving them. Nor will I deal falsely in my faithfulness. What that means, he says, I'm not going to say I'm faithful and then break my faithfulness. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Once I've sworn by my holiness, I'm not going to lie to David or his descendants. Shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, and the witness in the sky is faithful, meaning that the moon will never be extinguished until a certain time. It's going to be there, and I'm the witness to those people. So when God makes a promise, he keeps the promise. So again, they will be disciplined, but not completely rejected. Let's go to the third and final point, well, third point, I should say. How long will all of this last? How long are they going to be involved in this? Now, I wish I had time to put charts up here to show you when it all began, what the dispensations are, what the tribulation looks like. But in a general way, how long is this going to last? How long will this happen? Well, it's going to be temporary, very similar to the first point, not complete. So write the word temporary there. It is a temporary. Now, how do I get that? Look in verse 11. It says, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall... Did they? And there's that phrase again. No, may it never be. 
Have you ever thought about what's the difference between stumbling and falling? I remember when I was a I was teaching in Bible college, and um, my secretary came to the back of a class, and they said, "Uh, Prof, you need to get to the office right now. There's an emergency. I was dean of men, so I knew that something had to happen with one of our guys. I needed to get there, so I said, students, I need to leave right now. Just wait. I'll be right back as soon as I can. Now, that sounds pretty neat. I run down the hall to get to my office to get to the phone. No cell phones in those days. That sounds pretty easy. But now let me take you back in time, if you don't mind. It was in the days of bell bottoms and all those polyester leisure suits. How many remember those days, all right? And when you had those bell bottoms, these were so fancy schmancy ones, they even had a cuff on them. And so I'm running, and these bell bottoms are flopping everywhere. My foot gets caught in one of the, the, the cuffs, and I go tumbling down, and I'm falling down as I'm just crashing into the wall as I do this, and I look all around, did anybody see me? Nope, I jump right back up, and I'm going to my office, you know, just about like this to get to where I need to go. Now, why am I telling you that? The difference between stumbling and falling, when you fall, generally it's a more of a permanent situation, but when you stumble, you're going to stumble and get back up again. And so what you're seeing here is a stumbling of Israel, but not a total fall and annihilation by God of Israel. So it's a temporary thing, not a complete thing with them. So why were they set aside? Now we're getting into the meat. This gets really good. So if they did all of this stuff, and God still loved them, and all he did was discipline them, and he had all these promises, why in the world did he ever set them aside? Here it is. So that the Gentiles could be saved. Look at the verse there. It says, but by their transgression, salvation comes to the Gentiles. So in other words, by the wrong choices of the Jews their transgression, then God gave the attention to the Gentiles so the Gentiles then could hear about the Lord. Now, those of you that are a little bit into the word, you might understand this. Out of the 12 apostles, one was a rummy, so you're down to 11. They added another one. Don't see much about him. Then they added a 13th one, which would be the apostle Paul. The two big mouths of the group would be Paul and Peter. Peter was assigned to specifically go back to the Jews and give the Jews salvation. And that's why you find a lot with Peter, tremendous amount of persecution as he goes through the book of Acts. And you see what he's doing because he's trying to reach the Jews. The apostle Paul, though, was given a calling by the Lord to go specifically to the Gentiles. But he loved the Jews so much, since he was a Jew, he would go into the synagogues first when he went into a town, and he always went to the Jew first, but also then to the Gentiles, although his calling was mostly to the Gentiles. So what was happening? The Lord says, okay, Jews, you are my people, but you're not getting the message, you're not following my call to trust in the Messiah, Jesus. So he says, I'm now going to now turn my attention to the Gentiles. Now when you read that, it's kind of like the Lord says, now what am I going to do? The Jews are bad. Let me see if I can come up with a plan. I don't want you to look at it that way. I want you to know that God in his divine, eternal wisdom, he already knew before he made the Jews, the Jews, he already knew what they were going to do, what was going to happen. He knew what the game plan was for part B. All of that was a signal to reach another people group with the same message. The Jews had to get saved the same way that the Gentiles do. The Gentiles got saved the same way the Jews did. Old Testament people get saved the same way the New Testament people do. The New Testament people get saved the same way the Old Testament people do. It is always by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone alone for the glory of God alone. Now, you might have other vestiges around this of things that they might do, like the, uh, the, the, the sacrifices and the special holy days, but none of those things added up to this is what you do to get saved. So now he turns his attention to the Gentiles so that they could be saved. Now, let me take you back to my first illustration. Now, remember I told you about my sister going down the chute and then I was put in a timeout. I believe with all of my heart that my mother, as smart as she was, and while I'm sitting in this timeout, and I'm just, you know, frying because I want to do something, I don't want to sit there, you know, and she's loving on my sister. I imagine my mom leaned over to my sister and hugged her and whispered in her ear and said, now I know that you're seeing what's happening to Stanley over there. Now if you ever do something that dangerous, I want you to know that you will be put in a timeout too. So in other words, by my disobedience, my sister was given truth. And as I look back down memory lane in the Stan and Marianne album, I hardly ever see my sister getting in trouble. I don't ever remember her getting put in time out. I really don't. I can't ever remember my mom or dad having a crossword at my sister. So when I got older, I asked her, I said, how come you were always so good? And she said, it was very easy. It's because you were always so bad. Honestly. And it wasn't that that I was so bad as by my badness, 
she was able to see what mom and dad would do to my badness and she knew how to navigate better because of that. Now that's a whole thing on child growth and development just in that whole scheme because that really does work. But that's what's happening here. Because of what the Jews did, the attention now is turned to the Gentiles. The second reason was to make Israel envious, which really happened, to make Israel envious. Now remember what happened. They were doing something that was wrong and now they're getting the gospel, uh, the, the Gentiles are, and they're coming to know Christ as Savior. They're coming into the churches. Things are happening to them. So now they look at that, the Jews do, and say, I'd like to have some of that myself. And it's so interesting now. Let me see if I can take you back in time. You know you have the church here. It's made up of all different ethnic groups and we pretty well have what we might call a Gentilized church which means we have very little vestiges of anything that would be Jewish. We don't sing Jewish old songs. We don't, we don't conduct our worship service in perhaps the same style of a synagogue type service. We don't see that happening here. So we're going to call ourselves a Gentilized church, although the church itself is made up of anyone who's a believer, Jew or Gentile. We get that. Now you have Jewish people. They now see that we have uh, freedom in Christ now. We know that we have eternal life. We have joy. We have peace. We have everything that God will give to those that are Christians. And even to boot, when we live for the Lord, there's that extra sense of, of uniqueness with God that we have. They then hear the message. God sovereignly brings it to them, brings them the Spirit, brings them conviction. They come to faith in their Messiah. And now they see that and they're envious because of what we have. But at the same time, you have what we call messianic fellowship. Say that out loud with me. Messianic fellowship. The reason they call it messianic is because those Jews are now believing that Jesus is their Messiah, so Christ is at the center of it, and they're believing that by faith alone in the Messiah, alone for their salvation. It's a fellowship because it's often made up majority of other Jewish people who came to faith in the Messiah. Now, there'll be some Gentiles that will come in there as well. And a lot of that is because of the envy that they have seen with us. Then they come to know Christ. They get excited about what's happening. But they still like to have some of their, and if I can dare use this word, some of their Jewish culture in it. And that's not necessarily wrong, but that does fit them. All right, so what should be our attitude right now toward Israel and all that's going on? What should be our attitude toward Israel? Well, I'd like to say it very simply. What it says here in this passage and I, I wish I had time to go through it, but I want you to read verses 17 to 24 when you get home, and you're going to find out the warning there. Now Paul turns his attention away from the Jewish people that are Christians in the, synagogue, in the uh, church there at Rome. He now turns his attention to the Gentile believers, and he's basically saying to them, don't get haughty. Don't get haughty. Just like there was judgment with the Jews, there can be judgment with you all. God will not abandon you, but there will be discipline there. So I want you to know that God began here with faith alone and Christ alone, but don't get haughty just because you know Christ is your Savior. Remember that it's His kindness, it is His grace, it is His sovereignty that He saved us by faith alone. The next question was, how long is this setting aside going to last? Look in verse 25, if you will. There's a little, unique little phrase in this verse that gives us a little window on when that is. It says, for I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. Again, that's a favorite phrase with Paul. I don't want you to be ignorant. And then he says, so that, or, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. In other words, don't get haughty. That a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. So that means that this is ultimately going to end. There's a fullness of the Gentiles. Some people say that's going to happen during the tribulation. I'm getting very deep for some of you. But during the tribulation, there won't be many Christians at the beginning of it. There won't be any Christians at the beginning of it because they're all raptured out. So now we have two witnesses that come in. They've got to lead people to Christ through the witnesses. 144,000, they go. And then there's out of every tongue, voice, and multitude during the tribulation of people coming to know Christ as Savior. But the predominant focus during the tribulation is not going to be the church. It's going to be Israel, the Jews. So I'm sensing that the fullness of the Gentiles is going to happen at the beginning. At the, at the end of the church age, but before the tribulation, that then the attention is now turned toward the Jews. Now watch carefully. Even though there'll be so many Jewish people during the tribulation coming to faith, there'll also be many Gentiles coming to faith in the Lord, but the predominant focus will still be on the Jews, just like I said, during that period of time. And then at the end of the seven years, then he sets up his eternity future. I'm looking at the clock, so let me just give you this last verse and then we'll end with the passage. Turn, if you will, to Zechariah. I love Zechariah 
It's a great book. It has a lot of prophecy in here referring to the Messiah, Jesus, that you ought to read. And then you can see how it's fulfilled in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All right, But I want you to look at this one passage if you can. And this would be Zechariah 12.10. If not, just listen. The Lord is now speaking. And he says this to the Jews. He says, I will pour out on the house of David, referring to the Jews, and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, those who are living there specifically, I'll give them the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. Ooh, that's a prophecy of the Messiah going to the crucifixion. They'll look upon me in the future of them whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for the only son. Hmm, again, referring to Christ. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. So a sense... He's saying, in the future, they will now look to the Messiah who is now dead and risen again from the dead. And they're going to look upon him whom they have pierced. And they're going to look on him now in a faith looking upon him. Now, if you will go a little bit further in chapter 13, in verse 8, it says, And it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, verse 10, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but a third will be left in it. Which means two-thirds of the Jews that have never come to faith they will then perish, but a third that have come to faith will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire and refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, Jehovah. Call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. And I will answer them. And how will I answer them? I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord Jehovah is my Lord, my God, referring again to the Messiah. So there is a future coming for Israel that they will come to Christ, their Messiah, by the multitudes of them, where right now they're trickling in little by little. And that again shows that God set them aside, but he hasn't rejected them. Now, that's a lot of information for you to digest. So I want to end with not just a history lesson, I want to end with a celebration. When Paul was all finished with this, I believe by the Holy Spirit now within him writing all of this stuff and he's now having to think it all through and sense out exactly what the Spirit is having him to write down. And so he's putting all this information down about the Jews are set aside but they're not abandoned and the Gentiles that are believers ought not to be haughty but all of this is coming so that Jesus Christ would be glorified and people will come to faith in Christ. There's a great future ahead. And at the end of all of this, guess what happens? The end of chapter 11, he explodes in this tremendous praise. I don't even have to give you an exegete of this. Just read this. And if this doesn't give you that sense of praising and glorifying the Lord because God is sovereign, God is faithful, he will keep his word. Now, while you're transferring that to Israel, pause for a moment and say, just like he was with Israel, he is that faithful to you, like he was to the people group. He was that way with the individual Paul. Let's just look at the passage. Listen to it as I read it to you now. How excited Paul is. He's excited about the faithfulness of God. And here's what he says. At the end of saying, For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he might show mercy to all, that we have a faithful, merciful God. He erupts into this. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Sounds like Job speaking. Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? Who can do that? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Now, if you take that passage of scripture and you lay it in your Bible as it's found, and you start at Romans, I don't believe he's merely giving that wonderful, how can I say, doxology at the end of chapter 11, for chapter 11. I don't think he's giving it at the end of chapter 11 because of what he said on the sovereignty of God in chapter 9, 10, and 11. I believe he's giving this doxology in this place in Romans, it goes all the way back to Romans 1.1 1, 1 as it begins by how wicked we are, how much we need a Savior, how the very fact that we're secure in Christ can never lose, the sovereignty of God through all of this, the way that we're sanctified, and he ends with all of this, to God be the glory. Now watch carefully, and I'll end, I promise, I promise. He's doing all this to lay the groundwork of who God is, who we are, and we're saved by what he's done for us, not by our works. He now gives this great praise because next week... He's going to talk about the faithfulness of God as we move forward into service with Him. I said that 
to remind you that our core value here is that our intimacy with the Lord will fuel our outreach for the Lord. So perhaps that's why he said nothing about how do we live our Christian life until he laid the groundwork of doctrine first and then how to be intimate with him, how to celebrate his greatness by his glory that now fuels us from that perspective into serving him. So we serve him not because we're going to get something from him. We serve him because we've already received something from him. We serve him to give our way of saying, thank you, God, for who you are and what you've done in our life. And so when we now proceed through the rest of Romans, it gives us the the motivation to propel us to live a life separated unto the Lord because of who he is and what he's done and specifically how it's now fleshed out to the nation of Israel. Let's pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, only the Spirit of God could can so permeate your being to give you that kind of spirit of exaltation of the Lord. Not exaltation, but exaltation. That spirit of, of full rejoicing, but yet humbly giving to God the glory of who He is. Now, He's revealed all of this, and I'm going to tell you, we just talked about the mountain peaks, and we flew over those mountain peaks at 30,000 feet. Can you imagine what it would be like if we walked through these verses word by word and phrase by phrase slowly, and we opened up these phrases by looking at all the other verses and how it's all beautifully attached together in a sovereign God who inspired the Word of God to be errorless for us. Just this little bit, we can see the magnitude and the majesty of God. Oh, dear friends, those who are listening to this today, I pray that you will do the very thing that God so desperately is calling you to do, and that is to place your faith in Jesus Christ. You must believe that Christ is God, and He is. He is the great I Am. And that he loved you so much and because we've all sinned, we needed a savior, a redeemer, a rescuer. And the only one who could do this completely because of our depravity is Jesus Christ himself, the perfect one, who took upon him all the sin of us. And when he died, he paid the complete payment and rose again from the dead and it satisfied God the Father. And God the Son being God then offers to you right now eternal life. We're reading about his faithfulness. He's not going to then um, contradict his own character, for he cannot. And he says, he that believes on me will have right now everlasting life. And his character says he's a God who cannot lie. So if you believe in him, not believe he existed merely, but trust in him, believe in him, trust in him, depend upon him. He says, you will have right now everlasting life. All of the tenses are an immediate salvation. It'll be realized in practicality more in eternity, but you have it right now, and it'll never be snatched away. God will never lose you. You are a community of the redeemed. You may be a remnant, but you'll never be rejected. But you must come to faith in Christ. How much faith? Enough faith that it took for you to sit on that chair. You trusted it to hold you up, That's all the faith you need to trust in Jesus to take you up to heaven when you die. So maybe you'd say this to the Lord. Remember, those who call upon Him, you might simply say, Lord, I know I've done things wrong, but I believe you'll forgive me of all my sin, and I'm trusting in you and you alone to give to me eternal life. Now, it's not even a prayer. It's that mental transaction. It's that thing going on where you're fully giving yourself in dependence upon Christ for that forgiveness so that it's not of works, otherwise it can't be by grace. Now, if you're doing that, I'd like to pray for you. And so maybe you'd like to let me know on that card or see me afterwards. But please trust Christ as your Savior. Don't delay. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you now. We know that filling out a card, walking an aisle, raising a hand, None of those things will get us into heaven because those are all external. It's when we, in our heart, trust you as our Savior. Oh, Lord, the majesty of Jesus Christ, the faithfulness of Almighty God, the revelation of your word, how we see it played out in our own life as we open up the newspapers and listen to it and go to the news stations on the Internet to see what's happening to Israel. 
and how that there'll be tremendous judgment, but they will never be extinguished. Never, ever. And so, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.